Well, I would like to start with those two points that Alexandra actually noticed. First of all, Maidan as the place for innovation. I think that was a in very ex well, extremely interesting place, a laboratory of political creativity. If government doesn't work, if regime is taken over by one financial political group, you have to solve issues by yourself. So it was an attempt to create an alternative government and other political organizations. Another point that I fully agree with Alexandra, that politicians did not control Maidan agenda, neither the major processes that were taking place. And it means that after Maidan, this year we basically witnessed the processes of appropriation of those post-Maidan groups, involving them into political groups, financial political groups. And it's been done in several different ways, partially by political elite groups, partially by oligarchic groups. So if we take this uh, model proposed in 1990s by Arato, where we have political uh, society, business or economic society, and civil society, there was a sort of competition between political society and economic society who will get the social capital created by civil society. Or, and how these different groups or merged groups would involve political activists and networks to reinstate, reinforce uh, new political groups. If you look at the, uh, the, the list, electoral list or the party list that we had at the last parliamentary elections, you can see that uh, political groups, political financial groups made it successfully. So they involved political activists and they slowly involved them into political corruption networks. So we'll see who will win, of course. So, but Driven by the Maidan forms of self-organization, Ukrainian civil society have been taking over spheres of state's exceptional responsibility in the course of 2014, especially in the spring. Being in the risk zone of failing state once again, Ukrainian nation have nonetheless used the Maidan experience of civil society organizations to respond to challenges of war humanitarian crisis, and separatism. In the classical model of state, the functions of legitimate violence and transition of power between uh, elite groups are in the core of political regime stability. But since the flight of President Yanukovych and transition of power into the arms of political leaders associated with Maidan, these undisputable attributes of government were functioning with support and sometimes leadership of civic post-Maidan groups. Partially in the quest for efficiency of government, partially in the quest for its legitimacy, Ukrainian temporary uh, cabinet that started functioning in the end of February uh, has let it happen for CSOs, civil society organizations, to take a stake in the following functions. Defense sector, volunteer battalions fighting Russian intervention and separatist uprising in uh, April and May as a major force. Internal security, self-defense groups policing cities and towns of Ukraine. Propaganda, activists groups fighting Russian propaganda and promoting the post-Maidan case. Elections, attempts to create alternative activist networks controlling honest count of votes. And illustration, when civil society was a major public force promoting idea of power elites change. In all these cases, civil society organizations were playing an ambivalent role. On one hand, they were enforcing society's ch chances to survive in the critical times of post-revolutionary fragmentation and war. By doing this, Ukrainian civil society was fulfilling its legitimate raison d'etre uh, they advocated public interest and made the public institutions act more efficiently and responsive in addressing this interest. But on the other hand, civil society transcended the limits of advocacy for the public interest 
and started directly acting to resolve issues instead of government. Direct action of civil society organizations and their unprecedented political role have created an ambivalent situation where civil society was decreasing certain challenges for the nation, but created new ones for Ukrainian political order. This ambivalence has provoked a change in behavior of two groups that define Ukraine's development, political class and oligarchs. So traditionally, political class has treated civil society as either agents of the West or the counter elites undermining the rule. At the same time, civil society organizations didn't trust government and politicians. The beginning of Maidan, we, have, we actually had two Maidans, political and civil Maidan, also geographically split. Uh, but with inability of political class to adequately respond to the critical situation in Ukraine last year, this mutual enmity has leveled up to competitive cooperation. Ruling groups and some civil society organizations have established some forms of cooperation to solve problems critical for collective survival. Oligarchy groups have long detested third sector as their dysfunctional rivals in dealing with the public issues. After the Orange Revolution, the rent seekers created private philanthropic organizations that successfully competed with major NGOs in their impact on government, local com communities, and international donors. Ahmetov's, fo Ahmetov's foundation was getting a huge um, chunk of money from Global Fund to fight uh, tuberculosis, malaria, and AIDS. However, in 2014, oligarchy groups have recognized functionality of civil society organizations and attempted to use them either for increase of their rent gain or defense of existing power property. So basically, we have a number of cases that provide us with uh, proof of, of the both processes. Well, I would like to uh, concentrate or focus on a couple of uh, positive and negative cases. Uh, anyway, the, the, this, this a positive case could be a recent attempt of post-Maidan organizations, networks. Sometimes they're called self-defense, samoborona, but it's wider than that. Uh, in uh, supporting and advocating an interest in honest elections. I witnessed it myself in several majoritarian districts when the civic society organizations were pushing local administrations, police, to support honest process, honest campaigning du during parliamentary elections. It was really interesting. It's first time ever. I, I participated in many campaigns since 1991 in Ukraine, but it's first time ever when police was trying to honestly support transparent elections. They were very much dysfunctional in doing so. They, they were not trained to enforce the law. They were not trained, the, 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 the practices, the real, the reality was usually against it, but they tried their best this time to make, yes, to make everything smooth. Another case, the negative case of um, dealing with, with post-Maidan civil society organization is the Kolomoisky case. The, the, when oligarchs really try to use and abuse the opportunities created by uh, civil society. And uh, anyway, this creative or innovation, the post-Maidan innovation, uh, the volunteer battalions, they really are the part of this abuse of post-Maidan civil society. I counted, I have a long list of cases, sorry. So I counted how many uh, volunteer battalions are actually dependent on governor of Dnipropetrovsk and the private, uh, private group uh, where he's a major investor. So it's eight battalions with, with about 5,000 people in them. 
So 5,000 people are associated with an oligarchic group. Another two groups from nearby regions, from Poltava and Kreminchuk, seems to be associated. Since, since it's a shadow area, it's very hard to find the evidence, of course. So I, I needed to talk to different players or to check uh, open sources like Ukrainian media. But it looks like it's about 10 volunteer battalions that directly or indirectly are working for the interest of one very strong regionally associated group. And it's definitely against the uh, stability of uh, political regime. So once again, it's very ambivalent situation that we have. And th there are four conclusions. So in the post-Maidan period, Ukrainian civil society organizations entered into spheres of state's exceptional responsibilities. They are participating uh, in defense from external danger internal security, law enforcement, and information politics, critical to political order, and in the transition of power between elite groups. Second, there is a group of civil society organizations established around those responsibilities, and political elites try to involve these groups into their networks. Cooperation of some new civil society organizations with old oligarchy groups is currently enhanced, which leads to an increase of oligarchic rule in Ukraine in me, uh, short to mid-term period. And strengthening of civil society organizations has an ambivalent end result. It makes government and power elites somewhat more responsive to the need of citizens, but creation of alternative structures in the exclusive domains of government's responsibilities hinders stability of political order.